Informed Sources is made possible in part by Susie and Pierre G. Villery. With a continued passion for public television, we are proud to underwrite Informed Sources. Please join us in supporting WYES Television. Hello, Marcia Kavanaugh. Thanks so much for joining us. Well, if you are awaiting trial in Orleans Parish Criminal Court, you will have to wait until at least March while the legal system sorts out whether or not past felons can be allowed on juries. Meanwhile, the battle to lessen the making of future felons includes urging folks not to leave guns in cars. The city's Office of Gun Violence, however, is mute on the topic because it has been shut down. Elsewhere, there is still confusion over the city's garbage collections. Mayor Cantrell denies implications in a police wife's divorce filing. And Carnival is finally ready to roll. Joining us to discuss these stories are Errol Laborde, producer of Informed Sources, LeBron Joseph, news anchor and reporter WGNO-TV, Channel 26, Lee Zurich, anchor and investigative reporter WVUE-TV, Fox 8, and Nick Crastel, reporter the lens and we are going to stay with Nick right now to talk about garbage pickup and garbage contracts in the city of New Orleans. I've kind of, you know, lost track. No, actually we're not talking garbage. That's LeBron. You were talking uh, the juries, the Orleans Parish juries. That's another kind of confusing one too because we're hearing out of Orleans Parish Criminal District Court uh, jury trials are suspended until March because of an issue with a jury questionnaire. What's going on with that? Yeah, so um, in August of 21, the law changed, the state legislature changed the law to allow people with felony convictions um, who have been off probation or parole for five years to serve on juries. And previously, no one with a felony conviction could serve on juries. Um, but what uh, kind of came to light this month was that the summons process that the criminal court was using, the actual physical summons that they were sending out, and then a subsequent questionnaire that, that jurors uh, had to fill out, um, still indicated that no one with a felony conviction mm -hmm. could serve on a jury. Um, so an advocacy organization, Voice of the Experienced, wrote a letter to the criminal court judges kind of pointing this out and saying, you know, the law has been changed for, for a year and a half. This, this shouldn't still be going on. Um, and kind of urging them to, to pause jury trials and to get it sorted out. Um, and initially the, the court didn't do that. They, they, started mo they kept moving forward with trials. Defense attorneys objected, and eventually um, there was a hearing on the issue, and, and the judges decided to, to kind of put everything on hold until March and ostensibly, yeah, get it figured out. So trials have been held. Jury trials have been held since this law was passed. What's going to happen with those? Well, it's an open question. Um, so, yeah, dozens of trials have been held. Um, next week there will likely be a hearing um, uh, for a man who, who was already convicted and has um, had a, put in a motion for a new trial based on partly based on this information. Mm -hmm. um, so we're going to see. It's going to it's going to kind of play out. And you know, the district attorney was asked about it um, last week and or maybe earlier this week. But in any case, said, you know, I'm I'm hopeful that we won't have to go back and, and retry these cases. But you know, it's a yeah, like I say, an open question. How did the court not know this? Well, that's a very good question. Um, so there was a hearing this week where one of the, the jury administrators uh, testified and, you know, said that she didn't find out about it, about the law change until till midway through last year um, and didn't really realize that, that the court needed to change its its procedures. I'm not, I think there's still... <laughs> That leaves open a lot of questions to me, and, and I haven't really gotten to the bottom of how, the, how that came to be. But another interesting thing is the, the civil um, judicial administrator in, in Orleans also testified, and she said she found out in August of 21 when the law was passed, but she found out through a constituent mailer that came to her house, and, and she looked at it, and it had some information about the law change, and she thought, oh, we might need to you know change our, change our procedures in response to this. There was no sort of mechanism in place to inform these administrators that the law, you know, the state law had changed in this pretty significant way. Um, so, yeah, it's, it's kind of, you know, 
shocking and 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 um, right. yeah. Yeah, there's no. There seems to be a real lack of communication between what's going on in the legislature and these offices, mm -hmm. um, and you know that would need to be improved. Explain to us what does the law now say. So the law now says that if you were convicted of a felony, you can still serve on a jury if you've been off of state supervision, so probation or parole for five years and are not under indictment. So you know, really. Any, yeah, anyone with a past felony conviction who, who's, who's been off probation or parole for, for five years. What about other jurisdictions surrounding, well, just anywhere throughout the state? Do we know this situation? Not yet. Happening? It's something that I'm, I'm looking into right now to kind of figure out um, which, one, which of these jurisdictions are, have, have kind of updated the procedures to, to, you know, comply with state law and which ones haven't. But, yeah, it could be a, a pretty serious issue statewide, I think. Yeah, definitely could be. Okay, so no jury trials in Orleans, at least until March. Yep. That's where they're holding right now. All righty. Thanks a lot, Nick. All Thank right. You. Time for garbage talk now. <laughs> and it's now over to LeBron. And in New Orleans, there has just been a problem with garbage pickup and there's been yeah. confusion over garbage contracts, who's mm -hmm. doing what. So what is it now? What's okay. happening now? So the latest is that the city has taken the tack with Richard's Disposal, who is the, I would I guess you'd call the heritage uh, contractor, considering we have two other new contractors. And the, the new tact, in my opinion, is that uh, they're working on this get well package, as they put it, um, to help that contractor come up to snuff. Uh, if you recall, during the pandemic, we started to have these problems with the two contractors, Metro and Richards, uh, labor shortages and some other things mm -hmm. that sort of we went from one day a week or two days a week to one day a week to some weeks of not having any collection. I, I think it's interesting. Um, one of those contractors lost the contract, Metro Disposal. Been some legal wranglings back and forth. Lee did an incredible story mm -hmm. about a, a week or so ago uh, with Jimmy uh, Woods over at uh, Metro about that situation. But the interesting tact, and I think what were the differences with the Richard situation now, is in the last month or so, the word began to travel just how much we're paying more for the new contracts. Now, the performance has certainly gotten better with Metro, I mean, with Ivy Waste and with... Um, Waste Pro. Waste Pro. Yeah. Uh, folks aren't missing that we're not getting two days a week, but it certainly is once a week and consistent. The issue is we're paying now for that contract, according to different folks that talk about this, including Alvin Richard over at Richard's Disposal, more than two times, two and a half times what we were paying for garbage pickup. And I think in that situation, the council, folks in the administration, people in the community going, hang on a second, these guys have been saying this for a couple of years now, mm -hmm. that the contracts, while they were low bid, you know, with the cost of everything going up and labor shortages and everything else, they were handicapped. The city even admits now that they, as Gilbert Montano told me earlier this week, well, we disrupted the marketplace. I've never heard them say that before. But if we're paying these guys this much, and this contractor is making this much, and he's losing employees because they're able to be paid more at this other place, city now is uh, working on what they call a get well package. And, and I have a couple things to add uh, uh -huh. about it. It's great stuff you just put there, LBJ. But I think two critical things. First of all, so you have Waste Pro and Ivy Waste who are getting paid a considerable more amount of money than mm -hmm. Metro was. And you have Richards over here. So Ivy Waste and Waste Pro collect from about half the city. And then Richards now collects from the other half. You have um, Ivy Waste and Waste Pro combined making about $700,000 more per month than Richards mm -hmm. is. That's about $8 million a year. So if you're Richards and you're trying to hire people, if you're trying to repair trucks, um, do everything you need to pick up garbage, you're at a huge disadvantage financially if you're making over a one-year period for one contract more than $8 million less than your competitors. And then it also mm -hmm. gets to a fairness point of view. Mm -hmm. Is it fair to pay these contractors X and this other Y for doing the same thing? 
And then I and then with the 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 make good money, where's that money going to come yeah. from? Because yeah. the the city had an opportunity to pay both of these companies federal dollars mm -hmm. during COVID and then after Ida. Ida, right? Where will this money come from? That is that is and that wouldn't have essentially cost City Hall yeah. a dime. So yeah. where is this money going to come from from this get well package? And is it still fair even if they give them a get well package? Yeah, is it fair? And I, there are a couple of different thoughts here, even from residents. Hang on a second, a contract's a contract's a contract. And if you're contracting and we're paying you to do this job, why aren't you doing the job? And so there are folks that feel that way. Mm -hmm. On the other hand, obviously the job wasn't getting done and needed to. there needed to be some adjustments. Joe Threat, the, um, the deputy CAO who is over infrastructure and certainly sanitation is under him now, mentioned the other day uh, about the fault in the contracts, that there were seven-year contracts, which he say which he said, you know, it's just far too long considering the cost of things change, mm -hmm. cost of labor changes, gasoline and all that. Uh, there is that as well. I would also just add one more thing too, mm -hmm. is that Metro, uh, or rather, Waste Pro and Ivy Waste are getting paid for every house they collect from. Yes. Whereas Richards is not getting paid from every house. They have capped the number and refused to increase that. So Richards is at a disadvantage there as well too. And you interviewed Jimmy Woods from, from Metro, from Metro yes. and he's, he said they've Despondent. been, they've yeah, been yeah. asking for years for this. Yes. And I mean, that's about another million dollars. That's a million dollars a year right there that Richards feels like it's getting underpaid. Yes. Metro was the same thing. And and, you know, there was a time when the city operated all this sanitation. Mm -hmm. I remember there was a big lot, I think, on Broad Street where the city's garbage trucks, so yeah. you know, that they were all there. And then they got away from that because everybody says, well, privatization is mm -hmm. better. Yeah. In the long run, is privatization better? I mean, would it be better if the city Look, was controlled? The city had good, co like the Metro and Richards were among mm -hmm. the cheapest contracts in, in the area. And actually yeah. some people in the garbage industry said to me um, throughout this was that th the city should have helped, try to help prop Metro and Richards up because mm -hmm. it would have saved them money, it would have saved taxpayers money. In other words, they rebid it. They get now like the highest rates in the area. So they're paying the Waste Pro and Ivy Waste this high rate of pay, mm -hmm. whereas if they would have tried to help prop them up, they probably could have kept those contracts lower and yeah. saved taxpayers money, but they decided not to do that. Okay, we'll see where this all goes. Yeah. All righty. As long as it lot. doesn't stink on the curb. <laughs> yes, yeah, so, so long as the garbage want. goes, right? Yeah. yeah. People, definitely, yeah. <laughs> okay, Lee, let's stick with you now. And regarding Mayor Cantrell, it's the... It's been a busy week, let's put it that way. Let's first start when is with, it not a busy yeah, week? Yeah, right. <laughs> uh, the press conference that she did hold this week, and this is regarding the, um, the, the, the divorce um, mm -hmm. filing by the wife of the security officer. Um, uh, the mayor said basically, it's not my business, it's not, our, it's not your business either, regarding this divorce uh, filing. Um, tell us more about that. Look, yeah, the, I mean, the mayor got up there and basically said, as you said, it's it's none of people's business. It's not my uh, business. Um, look, we reported on it. Others reported on it, and and the reasons why. So we so after we did our first story on this back in November, Mrs. Vappy did file for divorce. She went down to the courthouse herself and hand wrote a divorce filing. We didn't. It, there was really nothing in it other than I'm filing for divorce. We didn't report on it then because. We didn't feel that that was newsworthy. That was, you know, the public's business. It's a public document, but still, it, 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 the public didn't need to know. Um, when the amended divorce petition was filed, and it included Mayor Cantrell and allegations that she was in having a sexual relationship with her subordinate, an NOPD officer, um, during work hours some of the time, we felt that is when it became newsworthy. And the public needs to know and does have a right to know that. A public officer who was part of her security detail, yes. and that is Vappy. Yes, so Vappy is the officer. He's part of her security. He was part of her security. Yeah. They yeah. were together in a city-owned apartment during the workday. The mayor wasn't doing any work during some of that time. Um, and then now the wife is alleging they're having an affair. Okay, so regarding, you know, your reporting and uh, the use of the Pantalba and the hours spent there, the hours not spent at City Hall, et cetera, um, payroll issues, uh, the feds are now investigating all so the feds, So the feds already had an open investigation against the mayor. They were looking at some other things that, you know, had been reported on too. And, you know, they have widened that investigation and they're asking questions about VAPI, um, you know, some potential payroll issues there with him and then also the mayor and you know relation to that as well too yes so that investigation has grown some 
you know, the mayor made a national appearance on Face the Nation mm -hmm. last week and last Sunday, and not everybody was very happy with her appearance there, but she held firm that the city is improving, that the crime rates are going down, and that she's going to survive this recall. I mean, look, I think, I think there are people who don't like the mayor, and she gets on TV, and they're not going to like anything she says, and there are people who like the mayor, and she can get on TV, and they're going to like everything she says. And um, look, some of some of the some of the comments she made in that story. You know, I mean, the numbers certainly don't back up at least some of them. The crime issue, you know, it did. The numbers don't appear that in many categories it is going down. I mean, you just look at like car thefts alone. I think, mm -hmm. you know, almost every hour of every day this year so far there's About been 600. a car. Sto yes, it's car stolen. So I mean, the numbers. Six hundred is insane. Number. Yeah, I mean that's not going. That's gone up. That's not a going down that category, mm -hmm. certainly. Yeah. Right. Did she have a press conference yesterday also talking about the crime rate This was down? Wednesday. Or was it yeah, Wednesday? Yeah, her Wednesday okay. press conference, yeah. And where she was asserting that yeah, the, the numbers are looking yeah. better. Um, are they looking better I at mean, all? I mean, you talk to the Metropolitan Crime Commission and, uh, and even, you know, Jeff Asher, who, yeah. you know, the city, I, I think they would, I think they would disagree with that. Look, I think you can always, when there are numbers, you can always look at it and try to make them work for you in some category or something. If payroll fraud becomes an issue worthy of prosecution, where would it come from? Would it become from the U.S. Attorney's Office or from the District Attorney? Or I mean, it could come for a know. number. So, so the the Inspector General's Office is also, mm -hmm. you know, doing an investigation right now. The so city inspector. General, the city yeah. inspector general. So theoretically, they could, you know, they don't prosecute, so they hand over their findings. So they could hand it over to the feds. Mm -hmm. They could hand it over to. You know, uh, another agency, the 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 FBI. You know, federal dollars goes through the NOPD, mm -hmm. so that would give the feds jurisdiction to do something there. It's similar to the 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 feds have an investigation right now on the details stories that mm -hmm. we did on details and abuse there. That's a federal investigation. So there there could be potential, you know, wire fraud, mail fraud type of federal uh, violations potentially. We don't know, but potentially there. Mayor uh, recall. Where are the numbers now? What about? 15,000 short or so as of, of, last, um, of last week. And not too many weeks left to gather these signatures. No, right after Mardi Gras. Is that mm -hmm. correct? Yeah, day after right Mardi after, Gras, I believe, okay. yeah. Mm -hmm. All right, like you said, it's always a busy week. It never stops. All right, Lee, thanks a lot. E, over to you. Talking about Mardi Gras, looks like we're going to have parades going their full routes. Well, you know, if you look at the, the three most important, or at least most historic carnivals in the world, which would be New Orleans and and in, the, in Rio and Venice, uh, all of them two years ago were just like shut down. And last year came back, kind of scaled back a little, kind of limped along. But this year they're back. And so there's, there's you know, there's celebration in, in, in all those places. So the, there was a press conference during the week. The mayor was there and there's a big kumbaya uh, moment. Everybody was hugging and congratulating everybody that somehow a few weeks ago when he said they needed to find all these police, I didn't see how they could possibly do it. That apparently came out. I mean, one person that was getting a lot of credit is someone we barely know, and that's the new sheriff, Susan Hutton, who apparently uh, called other sheriff's offices. And she's so new, the other sheriffs probably don't even know her, okay? I mean, um, they might have read about it in the paper. But, but she got some credit uh, for getting other people, and, and, and the captains seemed to think that they, that they got the number of people. And the big thing was when the city said that they wouldn't pay these people more money than they originally said, something equal to the police. And so everybody seemed convinced from that meeting. There wasn't anybody saying, well, wait a minute, I think you're, um, you know, you're all being too optimistic. So it seems like it's going to happen. And you know, I was just wondering, if this is the future, this might be a good thing for area police departments to know that if you work in Jefferson Parish, or Feliciana Parish, East Baton Rouge, that you could have a chance to make overtime money in New Orleans from Mardi Gras every year, okay? And they'll put you up and, and all that. And so maybe this can prove to be a, a good thing in the long run. Because the issue, of course, was is safety, and safety along the routes and the police shortage mm -hmm. in New Orleans. So the mayor is saying that we will have enough officers to, to patrol. Yeah, uh, just prior to us coming, we got the alert earlier that Monday is the official press mm -hmm. conference of the announcement with the mayor and the Mardi Gras captains as well to sort of officially say, hey, it's a done deal and we're there. We, we were told earlier this week, yeah, 
We're, we're pretty close. We think it's going to happen. There'll be an official announcement coming in, so they schedule it for Monday. So it appears as if that's going to be the deal. So Toth will roll in front of Children's Hospital and Up Magazine, yeah. and I, others will start at Magazine I, and Jefferson. That's the way it's looking. It, well, whenever this discussion with was had, Toth was always the big thing that people yeah. talked yeah. about because they had this serpentine route through right. Uptown. Yeah. Uh, and so it took a lot of, uh, it took a, a, a lot of security uh, to protect that. But, but the Toth captain was with uh, quoting the paper and he was up. He says, you know, the crew is ready to go and ready to go. So all indications are good. I, right there now. was one other thing you mentioned about police and I, I've got to throw this in there because that conversation with Gilbert Montano earlier this week also included a quote about additional funding for police officers that aren't even working the parade route. That's and right. the reason being is because you don't want to have officers come in. Of course, there's chatter. Uh, we're going to pay these guys to come in, and we're going to pay this rate, and the guys that are on the force that are here every day that are working in the district going, wait a minute, right. what? I can't even go cover the parade because I'm back in the 7th district doing what I have to do, and so apparently there is money, uh, additional monies for those officers as well. Who are not going to be on the parade route, and those those hourly rates route. went up to, what, 50 to $75? From now that's for the parade route guys, yeah. For the parade route guys, okay. Yeah. Okay. Well, it'll be nice to have the the parades doing their We're full rest. Apparently, flesh with money, Lee, between this and garbage. <laughs> <laughs> We're finding yeah. money everywhere. All right. All right. Now, guns and cars. That's yeah. been a real big issue with yeah, the guns being stolen out of cars. Um, but also, I mean, there's an issue about people perhaps wanting to travel with their guns if they, they are legally carrying their guns. Yeah, the perception of us living in a dangerous city, and that's a reality for a lot of people. Most residents feel that way. Um, very tough. The ATF, um, um, Kurt Thielhorn, uh, the, Kurt is the agent in charge of the ATF and was in a radio interview not long ago and we spoke to him this week as well and he mentioned about the guns taken last year and this is legal, illegal, the whole nine guns seized is what he said. It's about 2,800. Mm -hmm. um, of those 1,600 illegal but of the illegal guns, 1,100 of those were taken out of cars in New Orleans. And twenty through break-ins, through break-ins, yeah. yes. Which of course we've had a big problem with. Huge number, huge, huge number. And he says, um, those are the numbers that both the ATF and the NOPD are using. Uh, this week, the city council had a meeting to uh, discuss funding and education effort for citizens. You know, please keep your guns at home, leave your guns at home, or whatever. Um, but also, they want to take it a step further and uh, fund some lock boxes for cars mm -hmm. and even cabling the gun to the car as we were talking about earlier. It would be uh, cabled pretty much to the seat. In other words, if someone wanted to take your gun, they'd almost have to take your car. Mm -hmm. That's happening already. Yes, that's well. happening already. Yeah. But Brian, that's sure. a staggering number that they're yes. able to get that many. 1,100 of 16. 1,100, that's almost un unbelievable. But the, um, Okay, it's one thing to break into a car, mm -hmm. but another thing, once you break in, to know where to find the guns. I mean, is there like standard places where people put their guns and these people know directly where to go to? Oh, I don't think so, but I do think, and what the thieves and what the NOPD says the thieves are looking for or breaking into more than anything are things like pickup trucks. I drive a mm -hmm. gun. <laughs> and, right. you know, I fish and I don't hunt, but yeah, I so, certainly fish. And So be careful with those yeah. guns and certainly yeah. bring them in when you get home overnight. Don't leave them in your car. Yeah. But, yeah. Folks feel unsafe, and yeah. you want to be safe, and if you've got your kid, your wife, or going out to dinner, or whatever the story is, it's a tough place. It is. It's a, it's a tough mm. problem, too. And speaking of mm. guns and cars, the Office of Gun Violence Prevention um, at, in the city of New Orleans right now really isn't doing anything. Yeah, the, the office has pretty much ceased operations. And this office is kind of, you know, Mayor Cantrell's um, big public safety, big, uh, sorry, treating violence as a, a public health concern. Mm -hmm. And this is something she talked a lot about during her campaign and it, her early days in office was something she wanted to do. So this office um, kind of encompassed a number of programs. There were um, kind of a youth employment training program. There was a, a program for people getting home from prisons and jails to provide them occupational opportunities. Um, and then there was a big uh, violence interruption I shouldn't say big. Uh, there was a violence interruption team that would go uh, to shootings and to hospitals to meet with uh, gunshot wound victims and, and provide some services. Um, but as you said, 
most of those programs have have ceased operations, and the reason is um, the a CEA with a fiscal sponsor that was the Urban League of Louisiana um, ended at the end of last year, and they were planning on transitioning to the mayor's nonprofit Forward Together New Orleans, mm-hmm. um, but that has uh, it, it is impending has an impending shutdown date um, after an inspector general investigation and. A lawsuit between the, the board and the director. So funding issues. Is it anticipated that this will be resolved and it'll get back in operation? So that's what they say. They say, you know, have told me that within the next uh, week or so they're going to have a new CEA. Um, but you know, in the meantime, they laid off all the employees um, who are yeah no longer working for the office. So we'll see. It seems like it's going to be kind of a tricky thing to to take a you know, month or longer hiatus and then and then start right. back up again. So. Is the director still there? Yeah, so the director, I understand, is being is being paid through the city, so it was not um, mm-hmm. affected by the, the CEA lapsing. Right. Okay, we'll see where that goes. All right, guys, it is time now to go around the table for other stories. Eat. The city of Lafayette is celebrating its bicentennial this year. And what happened in 1823 is that the state granted another charter to this place along Vermilion Bayou called Vermilionville. And so that area became a legal entity. And then in 1884, Vermilionville was changed to the name of, of Lafayette. But the legal backing for it came 200 years ago. So they're having big celebrations. And when there's not a bicentennial, they're having big celebrations in Lafayette anyway. All anyway, the, right. time, all the time, so. <laughs> No, but happy birthday, Lafayette. LeBron. Man, the only thing I can think of is this time of year, and I happened to see this yesterday going down in the Marigny. The kids are on the streets practicing in the marching bands, oh, and it's almost yeah. like having a parade in your neighborhood just about every day. <laughs> that is. That's pretty really awesome. That's really joyous so watch to out hear. for those kids that are marching in the and streets. And weren't you in the St. Aug band? I was in the St. Aug band. Would you play? Baritone and trombone. Yeah. <laughs> I can't tell you the year it would date me too much, but yeah, 1980. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Lee. Um, look, mine's going to be a little teaser plug, if you will. Um, you know, people have been, we've been doing stories on the mayor and Vappy and things like that. Thursday night, uh, this coming Thursday night on Fox 8, um, we're going to look into executive protection more as a whole and some questions raised um, there for the city of New Orleans that may be interesting to um, viewers. No kiddo, Fox 8 this Thursday. Yes. Mm-hmm. All right. Nick? Uh, there's a trial going on right now um, over prison conditions in, in uh, at a prison in North Louisiana, David Wade Correctional. A judge last year found them unconstitutional, and um, this portion of the trial is to kind of figure out what needs to be done to remedy those, uh, you know, constitutional deficiencies and, and the conditions at the prison. So, okay, doke. All right. So this Monday we'll find out for sure. Yes. What our parade routes are going to be in the I city of New Orleans. You said, hey, Tote is going to be there. And I can't see them saying, hey, we're all good except Tote. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> <laughs> okay. That would be another rocket. So I'm assuming we'll all be good. Fingers crossed. All right, guys. Yeah. Thanks a lot for joining us here. And thank you guys for watching. And we'll see you again next week for Informed Sources. Have a good evening. Informed Sources is made possible in part by Susie and Pierre G. Villery. With a continued passion for public television, we are proud to underwrite Informed Sources. Please join us in supporting WYES television.